another episode of the Information Addicts podcast. My name is Cassidy. I'm an information addict, and this is my podcast where I explore information, ideas, and beliefs and try to do those things more responsibly. If you have been following my recent releases, you know that I have been having conversations, sort of discussing this idea of religious deconstruction, uh, why people leave church, sort of all of those things of religious belief and, and how we kind of come to our understanding of those things and why we change our mind. And in the last two weeks, I've been thinking a lot about where do I go next with all of this? And uh, down the line, I do have some more conversations coming down the pike, which I'm really excited about to have and to release and to give um, a bigger view of, of people's experiences with religion and deconstruction and, and faith in general. But as I was processing and, and figuring out what's the next sort of area to tackle or what should I address, there was a piece of advice that kept coming to my mind that helped me sort of navigate in the direction of where I was going next. And it came from a former employer when I worked in the restaurant industry. So I worked in the restaurant industry for about 10 years. And one of the jobs that I worked, the owner of the restaurant was very insistent that in order to be successful in the positions that he was offering, we really needed to learn how to slow down to speed up. And what he meant by that was that often in the restaurant industry, there's this mentality of we have to get through the night. We have to put out the fires that are right in front of us. And we often go from crisis to crisis, putting out these fires without thinking about the long term effects of what that's doing. And he believed that if we took the time to slow down, prepare ourselves for the night beforehand and think about what was coming down the road in the night, we would be much more capable of handling everything that was thrown at us during the shift if we took that extra time before or even during the shift to set ourselves up for success down the line instead of just trying to solve each individual problem as they came. And by embodying that advice, I not only thrived in that position, but I took that with me in other jobs that I had in other restaurants and in other areas in my life as well. And so it, it left me to ask myself the question about what I'm doing here and what would it mean to slow down to speed up? Because I think often when we're talking about information consumption, and specifically in religious frames, there is this urgency of wanting to have the answers and have confidence or certainty in the things that we believe. And so we jump from thing to thing and, and can often get into this place where we're speedily consuming things without slowing down to really think about how do we do this better and how do we engage with people better. And so in that spirit, in order to kind of slow down and and take some time to get a better foundation to tackle these questions better, I'm not going to be talking about deconstruction specifically today, but I'm going to actually talk about a book that was really influential in helping shape the way that I move forward in this project. So the book is The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It's by Patrick Lencioni. I think that's how you say it. <laughs> um, and I actually heard about it from a roommate. She was working with a team and she was just trying to, you know, figure out how to um, create a better working environment for herself and, and, and try to try to, you know, beef up her skills and, and being able to function well within a team. And because I worked in filmmaking and often have to work with different teams and different crews and owned some of my own businesses, um, I wanted to be able to understand how, how a team might be able to function better, to have a more successful uh, time working with people and more successful long-term growth. But I also wanted to look into myself and see what are some of the things that I'm doing that are creating chaos or dysfunction within a team. And <laughs> why, not, why not take this advice that's, that's being given? And um, there was a couple of things that really stood out in the book. And I read this back in November, right before I started this project. And there was a couple of things within this book that really helped solidify the form and, and the way in which I processed um, or progressed in the growth of this channel. And the first one that I'm going to talk about briefly was the way that the author 
adopted narrative in order to help frame the content that he wanted to share. So with a lot of nonfiction books, what you see is uh, a lot of information and data that a writer will weave together with anecdotes and stories to help give a full scope of how to tackle an issue or implement a system. But Patrick kind of flipped everything on its head. And instead of writing in the normal way you would assume a nonfiction book would go, he decided to write a fiction narrative about a fake company and used that narrative to weave in the information and the system that he wanted. And at the end of the book, he does put just the, the, the raw data and the raw sort of uh, guidelines or suggestions about how to operate and acknowledge dysfunctions within a team. But I found it really helpful to see the way that he chose to weave these things within this story. I think reading this and seeing the form that he took, it helps me realize and understand how often as humans, we understand truth much easier when it's embodied in narrative. And I think for me, that's one of the reasons I really wanted to make sure that there was, there was story and, and, and grounding within some of the things that we were talking about to help us get a better sense of how to understand the world and information and truth in the frame of narrative. And I'm not going to get too deep into that. I think I'm going to do another whole video about narrative and embodying truth. Um, but I did want to mention that because I think this is one sort of interesting path that this author took that I found very helpful. And um, it, it, it gives me pause and, and helps me um, think a little bit clearer as I'm consuming and as I'm speaking with other people's about ideas um, to put their respect for narrative in the right place. But I think the biggest thing that I got from this book was the unpacking of these dysfunctions themselves. And while often these dysfunctions do lie within teams that you're working with or, you know, um, people who you have to interact with to build something, I think there's also a lot of these that are very present in our culture and our communities and are stopping us from being able to have better discussions and uh, better uh, communication in the way that we process ideas and think about how we are moving forward in, in living out the things we believe in and embodying those things. So I could try to unpack and explain the dysfunctions myself, but I think it would just be much easier to read them straight from the book because I think Patrick has a really good way of uh, expressing them and talking about how each of the dysfunctions sort of build on each other. And before I start reading, I do want to show you this little chart, um, sort of this triangle of the, the way that these sort of um, dysfunctions are built. And I'll try to put it in the corner or something <laughs> so that you can look at it. But I think this is a helpful um, picture to kind of get a sense of, of what these dysfunctions are and how he sees them building each other. So let me go ahead and read quickly the uh, explanations of the five dysfunctions that he gives. One, the first dysfunction is an absence of trust among team members. Essentially, this stems from the unwillingness to be vulnerable within the group. Team members who are not genuinely open with one another about their mistakes and weaknesses make it impossible to build a foundation for trust. Two, this failure to build trust is damaging because it sets the tone for the second dysfunction, fear of conflict. Teams that lack the trust are incapable of engaging in unfiltered and passionate debate of ideas. Instead, they resort to veiled discussion and guarded comments. Three, a lack of healthy conflict is a problem because it ensures the third dysfunction of teams, lack of commitment. Without having aired their opinion in the course of passionate and open debate, team members rarely, if ever, buy in and commit to decisions, though they may feign agreement during meetings. Four, because of this lack of real commitment and buy-in, team members develop an avoidance of accountability, the fourth dysfunction. Without committing to a clear plan of action, even the most focused and driven people often hesitate to call their peers on actions and behaviors that seem counterproductive to the good of the team. Five, 
Failure to hold one another accountable creates an environment where the fifth dysfunction can thrive. Inattention to results occurs when team members put the individual needs, such as ego, career development, or recognition, or even the needs of the divisions, above the collective goal of the team. And so, like a chain, with just one link broken, teamwork deteriorates if even a single dysfunction is allowed to flourish. Another way to understand this model is to take the opposite approach, a positive one, and imagine how members of truly cohesive teams behave. One, they trust one another. Two, they engage in unfiltered conflict around ideas. Three, they commit to decisions and plan of actions. Four, they hold one another accountable for delivering against those plans. And five, they focus on the achievements of collective results. So when I read that list and I listen to some of those things that require good communication and good teamwork, I see that often those things are missing between us as we engage in conversation with people who believe differently than us, but sometimes even in the communities where people believe similar things. And I think it's making it really hard for us to have productive conversations and learn how to explore ideas, consume information um, better. There's a level at which we are holding each other back from really being able to engage well within our environments and understanding these things. And we're so often afraid of saying what we believe or, or, or disagreeing with someone who believes something different than us because we don't trust we don't trust the ones around us we don't trust the people in our communities and we don't trust that we will be accepted even in the midst of that dissent and I think sometimes we have good reason to feel that way often as humans we fail and break trust so often and it creates these patterns in our head and we create narratives for ourselves that the pattern will always repeat and all of these things will continue to be as they were. And it can be really debilitating in the way that we um, try to function within our world. And so for me, after reading these things and not, (laughs) and, and, and sort of understanding how those things can stop from really creating progress and creating a healthy community, I started asking myself the questions, where am I not trusting and why? And how do I be more trustworthy? Where am I being unwilling to embrace conflict? And how am I embracing conflict in a way that's not creating trust? And, and you know, just going down this list to try to understand how can I start with myself in adjusting these dysfunctions within me to then be better at uh, managing the dysfunction with others because we're always going to have these dysfunctions and we need to learn how to process them and discipline them to be better at having these conversations and, and, and just living with other people in community. Now, when it comes to the top two dysfunctions, the inattention to results and the avoidance of accountability, there comes a question of how do we operate in those things with people around us? Because I don't think sometimes the insistence on those things are helpful for everyone at all times and all places. I think that really depends on the relationship you're looking at and the community that you're uh, participating in and and how how much are you a part of that and how ingrained is that within the way you want to live life and I think that you know understanding those things for yourself gives you an understanding of where you can commit to in communities and work through these ideas of trust and conflict on the lower levels I mean, there's always going to be a certain level that whoever you're engaging with, you're going to battle the trust and the conflict. And sometimes that means committing to that and digging deep and, and working through all of those things to have a better, <laughs> a better environment and a better relationship with those people. 
but it doesn't always require that commitment. And when you make a personal decision on that commitment, it can help in understanding where and how do you learn how to be accountable for yourself and, and holding others accountable too. And what are you holding them to? Like, what are the results you're looking for? What is the hope that you have to build through these relationships? And it sounds kind of weird to think about life like that, but I think there's a certain level of intentionality of how we're building our relationships and, and what circles we're, we're creating um, that, that help you weed out some of the dysfunction that that lies within the way that we um, live our lives um, I think these are all very complicated and uh, any of these can probably be, be taken to the extreme but I do find them really helpful in um, diagnosing what's going on and some of this fear and this uncertainty of being able to share ideas I think especially in churches you know churches are supposed to be the place where you are you can trust people and, and you can be able to um, say what's going on and, and deal with the conflict in your life and, and commit to something that's bigger than yourself and find that accountability and hopefully see results. Yet I don't think we always see it that way. And with so much trust um, broken within those systems and a certain level of uncomfortability to actually be able to uh, say the things that aren't always the most comfortable to hear within those communities it creates a space where people want to run you know if I'm honest with myself and really evaluate most of the communities or relationships I've been in there are a certain level of these dysfunctions that are present and um, the communities vary from degrees of how present they are. But I, I do think that there is something about acknowledging these dysfunctions and the way that they can uh, affect our personal lives and work towards trying to do those better within ourselves and attack those better and create a space where um, we're surrounded by other people who want to escape those traps too. So... Where do we go from here? I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to keep trying to work on those things with myself and continue to have these conversations in the spirit of those things, uh, of, of those tenants. I, I don't want to avoid conflict, but I also want to build trust. And I want to um, learn how to not only hold myself accountable, but work with others to hold us all accountable to, to the things that we're searching for and, and trying to figure out what is the thing that, you know, we're looking towards and what is this thing that I want to be the result as I continue building that. And I think that's always sort of going to change, but um, it's definitely going to take some time to process those things. And um, I hope that by going through this, it gives you a bit of an understanding of where I'm coming from with uh, the way that I operate with my conversations and with the, the people that I engage with and why I find um, those things important. I think that's all I have for now. So with that, I will close with the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference.